This is the Purple and Gold Hour, presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. Your spotlight on the University of North Alabama, featuring conversations with UNA officials and friends of the university. This is your look inside campus. Now your host, the voice of the Lions, Benjamin Ray. This is the Purple and Gold Hour presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. Your inside look and spotlight at the University of North Alabama. I'm your host, Benjamin Ray. It's an off week for UNA football, but we've still got a jam-packed show for you. Coming up, we'll talk with Dr. Butler Kane and Ms. Rachel Kuntz about the Town and Gown initiative between North Alabama and the city of Florence. We've still got football coaches stopping by as well. Defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell, co-offensive coordinator Tyler Rice, and UNA head football Football coach Chris Willis will all join us. Let's get into the action. We'll take our first break. When we come back, we'll talk town and gown. This is the Purple and Gold Hour brought to you by the University of North Alabama Foundation. My whole life has been about making an impact. Not just on the field, but in the world around me. My high school Spanish teacher helped me find my true calling to educate and serve others all over the world. I used to think the biggest college was the best place to start, but my search brought me to North Alabama. At UNA, my story matters, and so does my calling. This is the Purple and Gold Hour presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. Your spotlight and inside look at the University of North Alabama. I'm Benjamin Ray back with you. It's a non-football Saturday. Usually we're doing this leading up to kickoff, but today North Alabama football is on the bye week. UNA is coming off back-to-back -back wins over Robert Morris two weeks ago for homecoming. Last weekend inside of Brawley Stadium against Charleston Southern. The Lions will be back in action the next three weeks after this on the road, taking on Monmouth, the two-time defending Big South Conference champions, back home against Kennesaw State the week after that, and then we wrap up on the road at Hampton. Don't forget, basketball season tickets are on sale. We're still going to talk some football later on. We'll hear from head coach Chris Willis, defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell stops by. We'll also hear from co-offensive coordinator Tyler Rice. All right, let's get into the meat of this show. The University of North Alabama is located in Florence, Alabama. We talk about that a lot. And there's a great partnership happening between the university and the city of Florence. Let's talk about town and gown. Our guest, we welcome in Mr. Butler, Dr. Butler Kane, Assistant Vice President, International Affairs, Director, Education Abroad, International Affairs. Uh, did I get all those titles right? Yeah, actually, it's, it's Assistant Vice Provost. So, okay, yeah, there we go. Indeed. And you have a background in radio, so uh, we're, we're kind of going back to your, your roots. I am so excited to, just to be on the radio today. It's fabulous. And we also have joining us from the City of Florence, the Media and Sustainability Specialist for the City of Florence, Rachel Kuntz, a UNA grad. Yes, this will be my third degree coming from UNA. And what are the other two in? I've got elementary ed and my master's in education, and now I'm working on my MBA and just having a good time working for the city of Florence and being in UNA. A UNA graduate, you work for the city of Florence. We talk a lot about growth with UNA. You're working on your third degree. How much growth have you seen from your perspective? Oh, it's growing. It's easy. You can sign up online and you can just get in there and learn something new and, and get a degree. I mean, it and, it and it's beautiful. Have you walked through campus lately? It's phenomenal. Oh, my gosh. I love the lights strung across campus. It's unreal. Now, i got to ask you this, too. You're working on your MBA. You're doing it online. We had everybody on from the uh, College of Business and Technology on just a few weeks ago. And, and tell us about your experience getting your degree online, your MBA. Oh, I work full-time. I'm a mother of two and family, and I've been able to take classes as, as I see fit and do it online in my own time and, and yet get a great education and learn, you know, all kinds of new stuff. So you can back up what they told us. It's actually as easy uh, to do as they told us. I mean, it's college. I mean, it's classes. Yeah. It's it's hard, and you're learning something new, but you can do it at your pace, and you can do it when you need to. And so if I need to study at 3 a.m., I can, or take a test at 6 a.m. before work, I can, and it's flexible. Dr. Kane, tell us, uh, you, from your perspective, North Alabama was named the fastest-growing four-year institution by the Alabama Commission on, on Higher Education. You've been at North Alabama for a while, but yeah. from a, a, a perspective of working at UNA, how big is that? Yeah, I mean, that's tremendous. I mean, we're the, we're the only university in the state that can say that uh, right now, and particularly 
what UNA has been doing coming out of, we hope we're coming out of, this pandemic era that we've been in, and uh, whatever that might look like for the next several months or even next couple of years, for UNA to be able to post this amount of growth that we're seeing in some really difficult times for higher ed in general across the board, across the country, it's a phenomenal testament to the leadership that we have here, the people who work here, and everything that they are investing in, not only just in their their time and, and effort, but recruitment, putting the classes together, making sure that students are having a good experience. We wouldn't be getting all of these students to UNA if they didn't think they were getting a good experience out of this. So I think UNA has handled this exceptionally well. Well, it, it's great to see. All right, let's talk about Town and Gown Task Force, UNA and the city of Florence got together to find ways to, to work together, grow together. So, Dr. Kane, tell us, what is the Town and Gown Task Force? So, I'm, I'm new. This is my first year on it, uh, which is really exciting. I'm having a terrific time. But, but essentially, just to boil it down, the Town and Gown Task Force is a, a group of people coming from the University of North Alabama and also from the city of Florence. And it's folks who are trying to work together to, to recognize that both UNA and Florence uh, have a, a lot to do with each other. We can't really afford to, to think of ourselves as separate entities because the way that UNA goes, goes the city of Florence and vice versa. And so we've got folks who are really dedicated to a great quality of life, fabulous educational opportunities in this area. And so what we have done is we come together to put our heads together to think about, hey, what are some some challenges that uh, we are facing in our community and how can we, from both of these different perspectives, address those and just improve the quality of life in our entire area? And so essentially, that that's what we're trying to do. And, and Rachel, from the city's perspective, what are some of the ways UNA and the city of Florence work together? Oh, so the city of Florence and the university, of course, have a relationship and we've been working together for years, right? And so we've got lots of city services and the university and students and parents use those. And so um, this town and gown gives us the opportunity to be intentional about it and kind of document what we're doing and then how to move forward and, and do it better, right? right. Because, um, you know, we, we live together and work together. And so there's a couple of different ways. So you've been talking about um, the city services and we've gotten recycling going um, with the city since 1988. But now the university is one of our largest participants and making sure students know how to do that and how to do that right. Um, so yeah, anyways, lots, lots of different ways. And from UNA's perspective, tell us a little bit, Dr. Kane, about UNA's role in all of this. You know, I think, and I've worked for, for a few different universities, and, and so as you said, I've been here about six years now at UNA, but I think this is true of a lot of uh, universities and, and institutions of higher education. It can sometimes feel like you are in your own bubble, uh, even though we are sitting right here smack in the middle of Florence. I mean, we are just right at the top of Court Street, but on occasion, it could feel like the university is its own thing, and, and part of what the town and gown task force is going to help has been doing and will continue to kind of help bridging is that showing everybody that hey we recognize that UNA is a member of this greater community in the Shoals area and that we have a role to play in how things uh, go around here and that we need to be active in that relationship uh, and this is just speaking for me personally but as a member of the town and gown task force it's not enough for UNA just to simply exist in a geographic space here we need to make sure that we are reaching out to the city we have a lot of uh, positives to bring to this area as well but we also need to, to make sure that we are reaching out to the city on issues that we might need help with and so really when when it comes down to it if we can just continue to work on ways to show that we are all part of this greater community then uh, we'll all be able to move forward in a good direction. Going off what you're saying, sticking with things from a UNA perspective, I know you're very involved in the community as well. For UNA employees, why is it so important for us to get back out in the community, get involved with civic groups, and give back? Yeah, I'm involved in a, in a civic group as well. I'm a member of the Rotary Club and try to do a few other things uh, as well. And and I think that helps break down sort of that um, that barrier that, that some folks might, uh, might see, that we just have some kind of invisible... Uh, you know, wall between the university and the rest of Florence or the rest of the Greater Shoals area. And so I think that the more that we can get out and meet other people, we can even invite people to campus, uh, do events where we're really promoting it out to the city as opposed to just maybe a UNA crowd, you know, if you will. I think those kinds of things really break down those barriers and we just have to do them 
uh, more often. Uh, we do a great job of doing a lot of things, but if we can be intentional about that, particularly with this Town & Gown Task Force, our, our, one of our main goals is to think about these things and how can we, we make these things possible. I, I think that's, that's going to be great for us in the long run. Which is what we're about to do. So town and gown, as so far as our initiatives go, initially, we're going to start with the SOAR and, you know, play an active role, let the city play an active role into the students coming to campus and parents so that we can, you know, help them with city services and educate them about different city needs. And, it, you know, UNA students and parents live here. So we want to accommodate and help and blend and make them feel at home in this wonderful city. Students come to, to Florence and they really fall in love with, with, with the area. What, what do you think is something that, that students learn about the Shoals area that they may not know once they come that they need to know? Oh, we have a beautiful city, and it's not just downtown. We have a whole city. And as far as the town and gown partnership goes, we're not just the downtown and Florence in the University of North Alabama. We're the whole city. So you've got East Campus and the mall and districts and all the way to Shoals Creek Bridge. Um and so there's just so many things to see. We've got a beautiful town, lots of history, um, lots of businesses. And so we want to make sure that when students come to town that they understand the whole city and get to tour. There's certainly a lot in Florence. Florence is just continuing to grow along with the university. It's great to see the two going hand in hand. Now, you guys have some events coming up that we want to talk about, so let's take a quick time out. We've got more to dive into with both of you. We'll have more coverage to come. We're talking about town and gown with Dr. Butler Kane and Rachel Kuntz. We'll be back after this. This is the Purple and Gold Hour presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. I came and visited UNA and I saw the atmosphere and the student life, which really fit me and I knew that I would be able to do once I got here at UNA. If I had to pick one thing about UNA that made me want to come here, it would just be campus and the life that you see on campus. With UNA just being so close, that's not what I thought that I wanted. And so when I came and I realized I'm still going to have the same opportunities as someone who went to a larger university, that was one of the things that drew me in. The Purple and Gold Hour presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation rolls on your spotlight and inside look at the University of North Alabama. I'm Benjamin Ray back with you and we're talking town and gown with Dr. Butler Kane, Assistant Vice Provost International Affairs and Ms. Rachel Kuntz, the Media and Sustainability Specialist for the City of Florence. So we talked a little bit about what town and gown is. We talked about UNA's role in it. We talked about the City of Florence's role in it. And now let's talk a little bit about the, the history of, of town and gown. How long have you guys been a, a, getting together and talking about ways that the two entities can work together. So our task force has actually just started and we started in August and so we're really proud of our progress and how we're going and our partnership. But really it started um, several years ago. We had Dr. Kitts and the mayor's office came together and decided we needed an intentional partnership. And so they put together a committee who kind of did an inventory and, and brainstormed ideas and generated a report. Well then from there, they were able to come through and say, okay, we need a task force. Like we need to get some stuff done and, and, and really work together. And so the task force was put together this past summer and we got launched here in August. And so we've only met about three times and we're going to just keep going in our first events coming up with Halloween. And um, we've got a long list of things the way we're going to work together, you know, in 2022. So we're real excited. And how often do you guys meet? Twice a month, sometimes once a month, and uh, the expectation is that that'll pick up more once we get into the new year and, and we really start uh, pushing forward on some other initiatives that we're looking into. So let's say people out there want to get more information, want to keep up with what you guys are doing. Where do they go? So I think, uh, Benjamin, the couple of easiest places is you can find us on Facebook. So we have a Facebook page just called Town and Gown. And uh, if you pull that up, you'll notice we've got the blended icon right there. It's very easy to find. That includes... UNA's uh, rather distinctive uh, architectural arch, and it's also it also has the city of Florence's iconic fleur de lis on there, so it's really easy, black and white. You can find that. So again, that's town and gown on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram, and that's at town underscore gown, uh, and it's got the same image on there as well. So easy for folks to find us. All right. So first big event, Halloween, Saturday, 
It's already, it's already taken place. Tell us what exactly what this event was. It's really cool. So it's an opportunity for the city departments, the university departments, businesses, civic clubs to come together, set up um, trunks or treats, you know, just and have um, we're going to take two blocks to, down Court Street is what we've done. And so they set up the different cars. People can walk through. The pedestrians have walked through, pick up candy, and it's safe. So you can walk through and Draft traffic is one way um, to kind of keep us, which is the history of Halloween. So we did this last year. This is our second year. And the reason why is because we're in the middle of a pandemic and there was just not a lot to do and not a lot of you know, events were not happening. We couldn't go indoors. And so Halloween was developed by Michelle Eubanks, was a grand idea. And it was brilliant because it gave us an opportunity to have an event and um, get people to come out and celebrate. And so Halloween and Halloween are, you know, together because we've got the Paul. That's right. We're, you know, we're the lions. So, uh, and we've got, if you, if you look downtown too, you can see Paul's. Uh, throughout uh, Court Street. We've got them on campus as well. So all of that really just kind of uh, matches up really, really well. And we had a lot, we've had a lot of support in this second year. A couple of dozen organizations, uh, groups had signed up to, to do this. So we really appreciate uh, their support of this. And, and we're probably looking at this sort of being maybe an annual event that the Town and Gown Task Force is looking into. Th we're really not a, so much an event driven uh, group we're really not trying to plan a bunch of events but this was so popular and got so much feedback uh, positive feedback that that we decided to adopt that and we'll probably be doing this uh, every year the rest of the things we'll be doing are talking about you know challenges that we can we can address and all of that type of thing but as far as an event goes the response has been great for this one and we'll probably keep doing it what does it take to pull off something like this you know, just uh, a, a little bit of a willingness. Uh, everybody around the uh, on the task force uh, thought that it was a tremendous idea, and it wasn't this organization's idea. But we have certainly taken that that football and continuing to run uh, <laughs> with this since since we're on a, on a non football Saturday here. Uh, but uh, everybody liked the idea, and, and we see this as as a genuine opportunity to bring some folks together again in the city of Florence uh, with our partners there, the university's uh, partners here, and just provide something fun for the community to do and so it's a terrific event to do that and it's doubled in size so you know the first year it was one block and this year it's been two blocks and so we'll see what the future holds but um you know we want to get out and get together and celebrate together and if you know when you get to see leo and una stand with the fire truck and the right. fire guys and hop in the police car i mean it's just it's it's a perfect iconic blending of the city and university and local and local businesses and organizations it's all of us together Certainly great to see everybody coming together. So, Rachel, what other ways do you see these two entities working together in the future? Oh, we can't wait. We'll um, have the university be a part of the State of the City addresses. We're going to have um, the city get involved in SOAR and communities come into town. Um, we're going to address issues, um, walkability, and keep promoting things through the town and, and things that access and um, – access for the university and you know the safety part and you don't realize how safe Florence is but we have you know hands down a great police department and, and force and fire department and city services and so we want the students to know that we want the parents to feel comfortable with people coming to town and understanding how safe it is we want to tour them through the city and let them experience it. And so, um, we, you know, the safety thing is just making sure everybody understands, you know, how to, to access services and how safe we are. I mean, do you feel safe, Butler? Yeah, you know, uh, with international affairs now, uh, one of the things that we hear from our international students all the time is that how, how much they enjoy feeling uh, safe and getting to study in a safe environment and uh, you know they hear from a lot of the other friends who are in other parts of the country where maybe that's not really the narrative but this comes up consistently with our international students who really enjoy what what they describe as a smaller mm -hmm. town feel they feel like they can they can uh, get to places uh, particularly close to campus pretty easily and, and as we've been talking about we're trying to find ways to make sure that they can get to to a wider area of the city as well that's something the town and gown task force is looking into but yeah they consistently talk about just feeling like they are in a community 
and that they feel safe and they enjoy this place and they tell their friends about it. That's one of the reasons why UNA has actually been increasing with our numbers of international students, particularly during this pandemic era when a lot of other universities are seeing steep declines in wow. international students. So UNA is doing well on that front as well. And Rachel, I know you touched on this in our last segment, but it's not just UNA in downtown. I mean, there's a lot for the students to take in from the entire city no the city's huge i mean well we're 10 miles but it's 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 large i mean you can go all the way out to shoals creek bridge and you've got a whole shopping area the mall and Publix and target and all of those shopping areas but you've got east campus and you've got shopping centers through and um you, there's seven points i mean it's just growing and and there's so many new businesses and and florence continues to flourish and we want to make sure that students and their parents are, are getting all of the experience of Florence. Is there anything else about town and gown that, that, that we need to know? Have we covered it all? You know, I think we're always happy to hear ideas. Uh, we want to make sure that as an organization that, that we are staying open to folks who might have an interesting idea or, hey, would you think this would be something town and gown could discuss? We're happy to hear all of those ideas because really what we're trying to accomplish is making sure that, that we are having great communication, great collaboration, and great cooperation between the University of North Alabama and, and all aspects of the city of Florence. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we want to facilitate those partnerships. We're not, we're not trying to just come in and create events and things. We want to facilitate and, and work through and, and make it just even better. One last plug for where people can find information. Yeah, so once again, on our Facebook page, that is Town and Gown. You'll see our uh, iconic uh, fleur de -lis right there with also UNA's uh, arch. And so Town and Gown on Facebook and on Instagram at Town underscore Gown. And please message us, follow us, and get involved. Shoot ideas your way. Yeah, yes. we need ideas. We want to partner with you. Now, Dr. Kane, I will circle back one second talk, talk some UNA stuff with you very quickly. International Affairs, you guys have a big week coming up, November 15th to November 19th. That's, what, two weeks away? Right. IEW, International Education Week. How excited are you for this? Yeah, this is really great. Uh, and this is the first time that I'm getting to celebrate this uh, because I've spent uh, the last five years in the Department of Communication, just came over to International Affairs over the summer, so I'm really thrilled about this. And this is a national event. Uh, universities across the country celebrate International Education Week. Week, and uh, we're looking for doing. We're looking forward to doing several things throughout that week. So we'll we'll be rolling out the agenda, uh, the lineup uh, here in a little while as well. But I should put in a plug for the Thursday night event, Passport to the World, at five o'clock at the University of North Alabama campus. This is when our international students get together for a couple of hours. They plan cultural. Uh, uh, sharing cultural events, music, talk about their countries. It's their opportunity to share with our UNA community and the wider Florence community, the things that they are really proud of about their countries and their cultures. It's really exciting to see. They, they get so excited about this, and we're, we're just happy to give them an opportunity to be able to share their cultures with ours. And so that's going to be the big event. That's Thursday night on November the 18th at 5 o'clock in the GUC uh, ballrooms on campus. That's so. I got to attend this last year. Oh, really? It's fabulous, and isn't I it? I mean, it is like traveling the world yeah. in booth to booth and getting to see these perspectives from students that are here and talk to them from their – I mean, it is, it's fabulous. Yeah. We, we have two international students that work with us in our broadcast department in athletics, and one of my favorite things is talking to them. I mean, hey, what, what do you like to eat back home? What are your favorite sports? Hey, how many people show up? You know, we get 10,000 people at a football game, and they're like, this is crazy. Football's boring. We get 20,000 at, <laughs> right. at a real football game, a <laughs> soccer game so I, I love seeing their personalities come out that's great yeah yeah they, they bring a, a, a richness to the campus experience that that uh, we're working on that's another thing we're doing here at UNA to to uh, in find more opportunities to expand that here on our campus and locally as well last thing and I said I was going to talk to you guys about this at the beginning and I, I overlooked it I jumped the gun I love asking this question the University of North Alabama what's your favorite thing about campus yeah. Oh, mine, it's just the beauty. It's walking through the, the the pathways and the buildings and the history. And, of course, there's Leo and Una and getting to go see them. And the faculty. I mean, this the benefit for me as a, an alumni has been the faculty. I mean, they're just bar none the best, and they make you feel at home, and they want to help you in um, the education. So, but, yeah. I gave you more than one answer. So. <laughs> I like it. I'll take it. <laughs> you know, for me, and this is an experience that I get to have on occasion, but just a few days ago, I took a couple of visitors who were visiting from out of state uh, to, to do some training, and they wanted to come see Leo, 
and they wanted to just take a look around campus. So I volunteered to walk them around and just being able to share our campus with them and to see them and to hear them talk about, oh my gosh, this is so gorgeous, or tell me about this history, or I can't believe you have this. I love this. And they're taking photos of campus and all of these things that they find so interesting about the architecture, the history, all of that. I really enjoy getting to share UNA with people who come from other places and give them just a little bit of an experience about what it, you know, give a hint of what it might be like to work here Mm -hmm. every day and to hear them respond so positively uh, to talk about the the beauty and, and everything that they're enjoying about our campus. That always makes me feel good. This has been great. It's been fun. It's been educational. Thanks to both of you for coming on and talking about town and gown with us. Thank you. Thank you. That's Dr. Butler Kane and Rachel Coons. We'll take a time out when we return. Defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell stops by. It's the Purple and Gold Hour brought to you by the University of North Alabama Foundation. My whole life has been about making an impact. Not just on the field, but in the world around me. My high school Spanish teacher helped me find my true calling to educate and serve others all over the world. I used to think the biggest college was the best place to start, but my search brought me to North Alabama. At UNA, my story matters, and so does my calling. We keep the Purple and Gold Hour presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation moving. This is your spotlight and inside look at all things at the University of North Alabama. Of course, there's no football game this afternoon. UNA football is off, coming off back-to-back wins against Robert Morris on homecoming. They followed that up with a 45-22 win over Charleston Southern last Saturday inside of Brawley Stadium. Three football games remaining at the, on the road next weekend against Monmouth home versus Kennesaw the 13th. Then they wrap up November 20th against Hampton up in Hampton, Virginia. Let's circle back and talk some UNA football. We now welcome in defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell. You can hear Coach Campbell every week during the countdown to kickoff show. We're happy to have him here on the Purple and Gold Hour. Coach Campbell, thanks for chatting with us here on the bye week. I appreciate you having me, Ben. Thanks. How big has this week been? I mean, you guys have played eight tough weeks of football. Is everybody just being able to hit the reset button? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it uh, came at a good time. You know, like you said, eight eight games in a row. Probably a little late for most teams this off week. But, um, you know, no, it, it's been good to, you know, have the last couple of weeks that we've had going into the off week. So, um, but, no, everybody, you know, players, I think coaches, everybody, <laughs> Everybody needed this this off week, so it's been good. Allowed us to kind of rest up, ease, you know, heal some of those bumps and bruises, and you know, still get get some work on the field with with our young guys and and some of the down down the line guys. So it's been a good week. Give us some insight. I mean, this team lost six straight to open the year. Incredibly tough schedule, but very competitive. And all six of those games had opportunities to win every one of them. You can go back and look at it. And then how well you guys have played each of the last two weeks and wins over Robert Morris in Charleston Southern. How has this team kept it all together? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's a, uh, a, a credit to our seniors. You know, it's a credit to the, the type of players and people that, that, that they are, you know, that's one thing I'll never forget about this group. You know, they have continued to show up to work every day, um, even, you know, throughout the 0-6 stretch. I mean, those guys kept kept competing. They they kept showing up, doing everything we asked them to do. So, um, you know, they put a, put a lot of work in, like like you said, you know, looking back. You know, we played really good in spurts and, 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 you know, at times played good enough to win some of those early games, just maybe not as consistent as we needed to be. But our, our guys have – can continue to progress you know they continue to get better and uh you know it's good to see these last two weeks and and um, you know we always talk to them you know sometimes it's not not how you start it's how you finish so we've we've got three games left uh they're all going to be cha- challenging games and you know we've got a got an op- opportunity to end on a special note let's go back to last saturday's win 45 to 22 over charleston at southern and defensively you guys shut them out for three quarters three interceptions Two fumble recoveries, a pick six that got called back, a scoop and score off of one of those fumbles from Will Evans, blocked a field goal, yep. blocked a punt. Was that the most complete game you guys have played, you think? Yeah, it was. I think from from start to finish, from D-line to, to the se- secondary, I think it was. You know, I mean, we um, came out, you know, played played re- really well. They, you know, they got some first downs, you know, kind of in the middle of the first half. But we were able to do, do enough to, you know, get some stops, get off the field. The turnovers were huge. The – 
the the block field goal you know anytime you can you know block a field goal or a punt um you know obviously that's a momentum swifting or changing play so you know there's a lot of people involved you know a lot a lot of people did a lot of good things so it was uh it was good to see you look back at that ball game and charleston southern had one of the top offenses in the big south the quarterback was top 10 in the nation in, in total offense a, a dual threat i mean what was the game plan going in knowing he could do both and you guys limited him for most of that game yeah you know we really wanted to force them into the run game um while taking care of the quarterback you know that's what kind of scared you the most was just him kind of getting out and getting loose which which he did I think he still ran for you know 120 something yards so you know he he got his yard he he's a talented player I mean you know move moves around well knows when to tuck it and run but um, you know, really proud of our secondary. I thought they did a really good job in man coverage, um, you know, and, and defensive line I thought con controlled the game. And, um, you know, we, we moved battle to, to Will linebacker some, so, you know, didn't play with a lot of linebackers, but those guys did a good job. So, yeah, I mean, it was a complete game. It was it was good to see. You know, anytime you can get everybody on the uh, on the travel squad in the game, you know, that's that's a good game. So we were excited about it. You mentioned the secondary. You guys lead the Big South Conference, 10 total interceptions, and it's been K.J. Smith most of the way, and he, he had one this past weekend. But we saw Jonathan Jordan pick off two. Lonzo Creighton's had one. Uh, Kyrie Fields got Kyrie his first got, yeah. of the year. And then Chase Brown had his first career interception. He actually took it to the house, 100-yard return, got called back for a, a block in the back. But that, that's secondary. We all know about K.J. How strong have those other players been? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of a, you know, almost have too too many it's hard to get everybody you know the the reps they probably deserve but um coach ferris does an outstanding job with them that's that was a heck of a play that chase made and and uh it was good to see that and um but no you know K, kj's kind of the 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 steadying force in that group and you know everybody's played played well and you know those guys um it was good to see Ky, Kyrie finally get an interception this year and um you know they we we change up coverages each week. We kind of tweak how we play man at times. So they've done a good job of, you know, really honing in throughout the week, trying to get a good grasp of, of what, what we're going to do week week to week, and they've, they've done a good job of it. You've had some young guys get in the game the last couple of weeks, especially on the defensive line. Tyler and Kowiak, I know he's a third-year redshirt mm -hmm. freshman, but still – Three more years of eligibility after this. We saw a true freshman, Tyreek Daniels, in the mix. Tell us about some of the youth and the way you've been able to work them in defensively. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's it, it's been big. You know, we Charlie Ryan was injured uh, early in the year, really hadn't you know hadn't played at all, and and so you know we've we fought a depth issue there, and 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 for some of those young guys to step up and play the way they as well as they have has has been really big for us, Tyler. Has had a really good year. I think he, you know, back back to back games with the sack, and uh, he's only get getting better. Tyreek Daniels is is going to be a good player. I mean, he he can really, you know, kind of this point in his career with us, he's more of just a pass rush guy because he, you know, he's got a quick first step, got some explosion. But we're excited about him. Um, he's done a really good job, and you know, we look forward to him in the future. Uh, Mac, you know, Mac McCluskey swapped over from the offensive line and has really um enabled us to you know have a little bit more depth in inside and be able to move pe people around so that's that's been big for us as well and you know we've got some other guys that that haven't played this year that that we're excited about ej e. colbert being one of them but um you know that that's a great group I, you know i can't say enough about what coach upshaw does really all all of our coaches do do a great job with their position groups and um you know we're losing a lot at that spot and um we're gonna have to you know go out and do a really good job recruiting some of the guys that we lose, but feel like we got a good nucleus coming back, and we're excited about it. Wrapping up our Purple and Gold Hour conversation with UNA defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell. And, Coach Campbell, I want to talk about a five-year guy with you. Will Evans came back this year. I know it's a deep linebacker group, but how special is it when a player like him gets that moment, a scoop and score yeah. touchdown? No, it, it was it was awesome. You know, we were going – I was going crazy there on the sideline. You know, I just remember there was a – a game last year, we all kind of give him a hard time. I thought there was a, a fumble he could have scooped up and scored. Maybe Southern Miss or s somebody last year. But, um, no, to see him have that moment, you know, there in his senior year was, was something I'm sure he'll he'll always remember. And, and, you know, we can't 
speak enough about what Will's done for us as a program. He's put in a lot of hours, a lot of work, been a really good teammate. So we're excited to see that. Defensively, what do you guys work on during the bye week? Well, I think, you know, it's a lot of fundamentals. Um, we work on, you know, fundamentals, things that have kind of given us issues, you know, throughout this, this season, kind of clean up some, some of those areas. Um, you know, got to get some new new guys, some some good reps in practice and Pascal and and going to do a little scrimmage this week and all at the same time working towards Monmouth. You know, that, that's going to be a big game. They're an outstanding program and got got another really good football team this year. So uh, trying to get all that kind of mixed in, you know, all in one and um, done, a, done a good job so, so far. And, um, you know, like I said, our guys just – they continue to show up, do a great job, and, you know, we're excited about these last three weeks. Three games remaining. Uh, tell me, start to finish with this defense, what's impressed you most? Well, you know, I, I think their their attitudes and, and, and their willingness to, to you know, compete and, and show up. You know, I mean, when you're 0-6 now, nothing nothing's easy, you know, and it's it's easy to start pointing fingers at, at, at coaches or other players. And for, for, the most car, for the most part, our guys have not – done that and and uh, we've had some some really good senior leadership that, that have kind of steadied the waters there at times and um, you know for them to have the uh, the games they've had the last two weeks you know hopefully we can have some carryover and finish this thing on a great note. Coach Campbell we appreciate you chatting with us here on this bye week. I appreciate it. Man. That's UNA defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell. We'll take a time out the purple and gold hour will continue presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation when we return. My whole life has been about making an impact. Not just on the field, but in the world around me. My high school Spanish teacher helped me find my true calling to educate and serve others all over the world. I used to think the biggest college was the best place to start, but my search brought me to North Alabama. At UNA, my story matters, and so does my calling. This is the Purple and Gold Hour brought to you by the University of North Alabama Foundation. It's your spotlight and inside look at the University of North Alabama. Here we are in week nine of football season. It's flying by. Football has a bye week, so we have no football game to get you to later. But let's take you inside the UNA football program. Here in this episode, of course, we're scheduled to talk with Chris Willis, head football coach, defensive coordinator Stedman Campbell as well. But we'll kick off our coverage. Co-offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach, pass game coordinator whatever else you want to say uh una football coach tyler rice joins us next here on the purple and gold hour coach rice thanks for taking the time to talk with us yeah man anytime ben and i always enjoy being on with you and uh talking una football this team's played eight games uh, we've seen a little bit of everything but how nice is it to get this bye week as you guys get set for the final push of the season well the best thing about the bye week is going in uh into it with a win um you know it's it's very, you know, rewarding that you, you kind of get a week off and you go in on it on a win that uh, was a, uh, you know, total and complete game by, by us, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, it just feels good to, to be able to do that. Let's talk some offense and sort of the, the growth of this offense and going into the season. The big topic was who would be the starting quarterback, and you started out with Jalen Gibson for two games. He got hurt. Then you had uh, Blake Deaver step in for two games. He got hurt. Now, Rhett Files has been the guy for, what, the last three, four ball games. Now, let's talk about that room as a whole. Have you been surprised at how well all three played when given their chances? I don't know if surprised the word, but because uh, all, all four of them, and you forgot about Brady as well, um, you know, he had his own, own package um, that we used him with, but – um, I think all, all four of them have the ability to, to, to win games in, in this league. And, uh, you know, you know scheduling-wise, we, we had some tough games early. And Jalen and, and Blake battled uh, the, those four games that they played. And, uh, you know, Red had a, a couple early that, that you know, he, he went in and played well, but we, we didn't get the win. Um, and, you know, we've kind of, you know, tur turned the page a little bit. And Red's done well these past two games, uh, 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 leading us to the victory. And, uh, you know, just very, very proud of them more so than anything. I always thought, you know, I had a really deep quarterback room with the addition of Jalen and Brady um, this offseason. So, you know, it's been been good. Uh, I don't know if surprise is the word, but I just think, you know, very, just very proud of them. 
Let's talk about who we've learned about this year. When you come in, in about Dexter Boykin, Cortez Hall, Corson Swan, the tight end, but you've had some breakout stars as well. Each of the last two weeks, uh, one of these stars has been named a Big South Conference Offensive Player of the Week. Let's start with Parker Driggers. 72 carries, 402 yards, six touchdowns. He's done a great job receiving out of the backfield, returning kicks as well. We got teased with Parker in the four-game schedule last season. What have you guys seen from the young redshirt freshman? Yeah, Parker is uh, probably our most complete player offensively. Um, and, you know, I, I think everybody would probably tell you that. Um, so, you know, he was, you know, just getting him the ball any way we can, moving him back to the backfield. That way, you know, we can hand it to him. We can throw it to him. He can take the snap. Um, he can do, you know, really anything out there. And, you know, we try to game plan accordingly for that. Um, but, you know, just, you know, with him athletically, he can do so much because he can catch the ball out of the backfield and, you know, obviously he can run it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, very, very, you know, proud, proud of Parker. I don't think anybody, you know, on our team is very surprised about what he did with the 99-yard touchdown. Um, you know, we see that in practice, you know, daily um, of, of things he does, whether it's a crazy catch or, you know, a long run or, or you know, juking out somebody. Um, we, we see that, you know, daily from, from Parker. 99-yard run. I mean, that's a record that will last forever in, in the record books. What was your perspective of that, trying to probably just get some breathing room? What point did you realize he was taking it to the house? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it, I thought – First off, we uh, <clears throat> excuse me. First off, we we jumped off sides twice, which was 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 not good by our our tight end, and then our, we had a flinch by our center, but uh, and it backed us up even more to the to the one yard line. Uh, but we we tried to you know just hand one off inside, and uh, you know we actually got kind of stuffed, and he had to redirect his path. And after he did that, the defense kind of over pursued to the left side. And once I saw him break kind of outside of the tackle box, I knew he had a shot. And I think the safety took a bad angle. And, uh, you know, you underestimate how fast Parker is. I mean, he can, he can roll now. And, uh, you know, after he broke that angle of the, of the safety's uh, tackle, I knew he was gone. So it was a pretty good feeling. Did your heart flutter just a little bit when he got hit in the end zone? Oh, yeah, because that's, that's, you know, the worst thing you want to happen back there is, <clears throat> excuse me, is, you know, giving two points away f to the other team. Um, but, you know, he made, you know, players make plays. He made a good play. You know, he didn't go on, he didn't go down on contact. And, he, you know, he jumped backside and, and made a, a great play. Takari Kennebrew, wide receiver, red shirt, sophomore, 6'3", 185. I think there was probably some questions offensively. Who would be the third receiver behind Dexter Boykin and Cortez Hall? Uh, TK was named Big South Offensive Player of the Week. Four receptions, 141 yards, three scores against Charleston Southern. I mean, just how electric is this young man? Yeah, so in, in football these days, uh, you know, speed, speed kills and – TK is the you know probably the fastest guy bar none on our team, um, and you know I think him being uh, finally healthy has, has helped him a lot. Um, and then coming into the Southeast Louisiana game, um, nobody really knew about him, so he kind of got a lot of single coverage, and people didn't know how fast he was. Um, so I think that was a kind of a credit to to why he kind of went off on, in that first game. And then, you know, coming back here, he, he kind of got hurt in the middle of the season. He's been banged up with a high ankle, high ankle spring since Chattanooga. So, you know, to finally get him back and, and going again, you know, he, and then he comes out and does what he does, catching three touchdowns. Should have been four. He dropped one in the end zone down there early third quarter. Um, but, you know, there's always room for improvement. I'm very proud of him. He's came a long way not only on the field but off the field in the classroom. Uh, you know, and he's 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 growing into to the young man that we're trying to you know produce out of this program. So very proud of him. So we've talked about a red shirt freshman in Parker Driggers, a red shirt sophomore in Takari Kinnebrew. Rhett Files is a red shirt sophomore as well. Are you pretty excited about what some of these younger guys are doing? Yeah, very very excited. Um, and then you you throw Shunderick Powell in there, who you know is probably one of the best freshmen that I've seen at this level. Um, you know, at the, at, especially at the running back position. Uh, so, you know, the future is very, very bright for this for this program and for, for the football team. And, 
you know, with, with all of them staying together, staying healthy and continuing to, to develop, um, they're going to, we're going to have a really good shot these next couple, you know, two, three years, um, to do some good things. Let's back up and talk about sort of the, the first half of the season compared to this half. You guys played a super tough schedule to open up the year. Seven teams were ranked in the preseason top 25. We still have to play two more of those. But now you go in and you look across in four Big South Conference games. You guys are the second best scoring Big South offense and Big South Conference play third most total yards, second most passing yards, just a half yard really off from the, the leader in Charleston Southern who we met this past week. But how much did those early season games prepare this offense, this team, for what you guys are seeing now in Big South play? Yeah, I think it, it prepared us. And, uh, you know, the level of competition we played, uh, especially, you know, with those those first four, um, have prepared us from a – you know, from a, a schematic standpoint and, and um, you know, just moving the, the line of scrimmage up front um, was the, you know, the biggest thing. And then you, you go against guys who are, you know, two, three-time All-Americans that we played in those first four games to some younger guys in the secondary that we've played. Um, but, you know, I think it's prepared us. And, uh, you know, I, you know the, the end goal for, for all this is, you know, yes, we, we lost those four games early to, to some – prominent you know foes but we want to end up being able to to beat those teams and that's the that's the end goal but you know just going forward and and coming off that those four first four going into Campbell you could you know see the the difference in you know kind of our confidence going in and, and after we had some success and then we've kind of put it started putting it together these these past two games and it's been good to see all right let's wrap it up with this you guys have three more games left Monmouth Kennesaw State and Hampton Monmouth next Saturday a noon o'clock kick of course we'll have the broadcast of that one but as you get prepared for these final three I know by week you're probably looking back at a lot of things what has excited you most about how far this offense has come this season I think, you know, just going back and self-scouting is, you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg, um, you know, especially with what we've done in conference offensively. Um, you know, it f finally felt good to, to not turn the ball over. Um, and, you know, we're growing in that aspect uh, from, from last game. And, uh, you know, scoring, I think it's 38 a game uh, in conference, which is very – it's very good, um, and it's a testament to to our players, and um, you know them buying in and continuing to to chop away at it. But uh, you know, th you know, the biggest thing is I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. I think we can you know continue to do to do good things and score more points, and you know put our put our team in the best situation to win, and you know not give the ball away and, and put our defense in bad situations. You know they play our defense played their tails off versus Charleston Southern and versus Robert Morris. Um, and, you know, we got we got to, you know, continue to take care of the ball and, and continue to grow and, uh, you know, get the ball in our best players' hands and let them make plays. And, uh, you know, that's what we're going to do. Coach Rice, we appreciate the time. Hope the bye week's been good to you. Thank you, Ben. That's co-offensive coordinator Tyler Rice. We'll take a timeout. The Purple and Gold Hour continues when we return. I realized that there was a lot of um, just business, just the day-to-day -day business of the chamber that I did not feel particularly comfortable in. There was an opportunity at UNA to pursue my MBA and thought that it might be a really good idea um, just to bolster that side of my education. Professors were so understanding and willing to work with us. I, I realized then I had made the right choice that UNA was the correct institution for me. I've never talked to anyone who's gone forward with their education who regretted that decision. It's not been easy every day, but totally worth it at all times. One final guest due here on the Purple and Gold Hour presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. Your spotlight and inside look at the University of North Alabama. I'm Benjamin Ray, and joining me now is the head football coach at the University of North Alabama, Chris Willis, a bye week for North Alabama, coming off back-to-back -back wins against Robert Morris and Charleston Southern. Three games remaining this season against Monmouth next week, November 6th on the road, back home November 13th hosting Kennesaw State, then the season for finale on the road up in Hampton, Virginia against Hampton. And Coach Willis, thanks for joining us here on this bye week. Appreciate it, Ben. Thanks for having me. Back-to-back -back wins against Robert Morris on homecoming. Charleston Southern last week, 45-22. to Is the team riding a lot of momentum through this bye week? I believe so. Um, you know, we've had a good week, uh, you know, 
I would say a light practicing session. Uh, I mean, we've we've lifted weights, we've met a little bit, we've scaled way back. Uh, you know, really beat up, really sore, uh, mentally fatigued as well, and so. But it's been a good week. Uh, anytime you can win, you know, it, I think it gains momentum, and you know, winning two in a row is really going to help us going in, you know, to this bye week. And knowing our next two opponents are two really good opponents, I would probably put them. You know, 11 game schedule. I would put these two in the top half of the toughest part of the schedule. I mean, we play four pretty good ones out of the gate. I would put, you know, Kennesaw's ranked 10th in the country, and then Monmouth was ranked. I think right now they're receiving votes, but they're picked to win our conference. So, we this is it kind of coming a good time knowing that we got those two guys coming. Health wise, I know you got a couple quarterbacks banged up. For the most part, this team has been healthy, but has it been good for guys to kind of reset, take their minds off football, and get some of those little nagging injuries healed up? It is. I mean, uh, you look around the locker room, we've got, you know, throughout this week, we've had to hold a few people during these practices. But uh, yeah, I think just mentally, if anything, some of them are going to get to see some family. They hadn't seen family in a while. And. You know, they come to the game and they may spend that time with them. But we've had some guys that live, you know, a ways off that uh, are getting to go see family. They they were off uh, pretty much at we from Thursday afternoon and we're bringing them back in Sunday. Uh, so they'll have a good little break Friday and Saturday. They we're not doing anything football related. And so, yeah, I think this is good for everybody. You look at the game against Charleston Southern this past Saturday, a win, 45-22. to Takari Kennebrew, four catches, 141 yards, three scores. He was the Big South Conference Offensive Player of the Week. Rhett Files, three touchdown passes, a rushing touchdown as well. Those two combined for the number one play on Sports Center top ten plays on Saturday night, Coach. And for this program, fourth year of the Division One transition, two young guys, two redshirt sophomores. I mean, how cool is it to see that play end up on Sports Center? Yeah, that was huge. I didn't know that, and I would kind of gotten up and got going through the day before I started getting all these text messages about it. But uh, yeah, you know, anytime our players can get out front on an award, uh, you know, they deserve that. You know, I, I know people know we work hard, but I don't know if they really understand what these guys go through. I mean, they just don't go to school and come over and practice football. There's a lot that goes on through the course of a day. I mean, they spend football hours wise. Sometimes they can be over here as early as two and don't get home till six. And uh, depending on what's all going on. And then you got your, you know, study hall and your weights and your foot, you know, your own class schedule. So to see these guys win some awards like that that put in the work, that was big time. I mean, you know, those are guys that's been in the program and, and have worked hard and battled injuries and other issues. And so I'm, I'm proud for those guys. Defensively, three interceptions, two fumble recoveries. One was a scoop and score but by Will Evans. Coach, that was one of the top – offenses in the Big South Conference in Charleston Southern. What can you say about the game plan and the execution? Well, we, we knew that he was going to struggle throwing the football. We wanted to contain the run. You know, we haven't been great against stopping the run. Um, the runs that got us Saturday against him was uh, him taking off and taking, you know, the quarterback runs. And so he's athletic. We, we felt like we did a good job defending the pass for the most part. And then we created some turnovers and made him throw into some tight windows and you know, then we had the big, you know, Wallace hits the quarterback, uh, sack calls fumble, scoop and score by Will Evans, who's been around a long time. And so glad to see those guys as well get in on the action. And just a great overall defensive performance. Special team-wise, you, you blocked a punt. You blocked a field goal attempt. Joe Gurley boomed a 62-yard punt. Uh, he, he had a great day as well. He had some great returns. We saw Sean Derek Powell, the young freshman, break loose, nearly take one to the house. I mean, special teams-wise, combining it all, is this one of the most complete games this team's played? Yeah, we've been pretty solid on special teams all year. Uh, Kobe Ellis does a good job. He, he coaches the punt and uh, the kickoff return. Coach Ferris coaches the punt return. Coach Poe coaches the kickoff team. And then Coach Lesko works the extra point field goal, and Coach Upshaw does extra point field goal block. So we don't like giving it all to one coach. I think it helps, and it, and it showed in that game, and it showed pretty much throughout the season. It's been really good. Coach King handles the specialists and, uh, and, and all their activity, the long snapper, kicker, punter. He's been here a long time, and so it's been working. You know, that's the one unit you do not, if you're struggling, you know, to win games and you're struggling offensively and defensively, you at least need to be sound in special teams or that's where the game can get really away from you. And uh, there are a lot of good plays. Michael Bland's block, Chase Brown's block, Shanderick's return. You got Joe punting the ball like he did. You got Sam getting to his first action, kicking it deep off into the end zone. You got Grayson making – extra point and field goal. So, I mean, all of them together did a great job. Certainly uh, coming off of a big game, Coach. And is it any coincidence that the university announces a locker room renovation project the, the Thursday of homecoming and then you guys go out and roll out back-to-back -back wins? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering now if we should announce it the first week of the season. But, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, uh, Megan and, and Dr. Looney and, and there's others. Uh, you know, Alexa's involved at Moats and people trying to, you know, generate uh, an opportunity to help ourselves here. I mean, listen, I've said this before. A locker room is huge. And, you know, our guys come over throughout the day. Some of them live off campus, and they don't want to go back to over to their apartment, and they've got another class. Uh, a locker room is a home away from home. It's a place to kind of, you know, sit down there and hang out with your guys, camaraderie. And it's not just a place you go get dressed. They spend a lot of time in there. And I know people get confused by the locker rooms. Yes, there are locker rooms at Brawley. But we, we live and practice over here, and so we have a locker room downstairs, and they call it the 1984 Project because that's how old this building is. And the locker room itself is just very old. It's got a lot of space. A lot of things can be done down there, but it's just taken, uh, it's taken a while to get us to this point. But it is a recruiting tool. I mean, we want to be able to show players that, hey, when you come here, this is a, the place you're going to be, and you spend a lot of time in that room. And we need to get it updated, state of the art. There's just a lot of things in there when you walk through that, uh, and it just it, it shows old uh, from you know. There's only so much paint and carpet and this thing you can do. You know, that's like putting lipstick on a pig. It, you know, at some point you you got to rehaul, do it all, and and I think Dr. Looney's got a good plan in place just based off of the meetings I've been in, and I'm excited about it. I, I mean, it's a it's something that's been long overdue. I mean, it really is. If I could tour everybody down there, they would completely understand. Visit RoarLines.com slash football locker room for more information. Coach Willis, last thing for you, fourth and final year of the Division One transition, and when you look back, year one, big win over Southern Utah. You played North Dakota State as well. Year two, we got our first taste of Big South Conference action. 2020 was tough. Uh, you played three FBS schools. Now 2021, just an incredibly tough schedule as well. But what can you say about everything this program has done the last four years as you've taken us from the Division Two? world into division one yeah i mean listen it, it was not easy and we knew it wasn't going to be easy but uh we had our ups and downs we started out the year seven i mean the transition seven and three went four and seven then we only played a four game season we've made money we've played some bigger schools um you know this year been a little disappointing i mean we didn't know how it would play out but you know uh we felt like we left some wins out there but uh overall i mean we've been very competitive we we're not getting blown away we're we're in the games we're winning some games there's just some things we got to close the gap on off the field i mean uh you can't just erase the two and put a one in front of the d you've got to do the things that come with that and i think there's a plan in place i think what we're all excited about being is it is the transition's over okay once we get through this season and we bounced around from no conference to Big South Conference. They don't count our wins to, well, this year they're going to count the game. And now we're moving to the A-Sun. And we're just ready to get somewhere and be still, be established. And, all right, this is going to be the norm. And, uh, you know, it hasn't been that way. Now, COVID, that's unpredictable. We couldn't predict the 2020. That was just all, you know, that was tough on everybody. But uh, I think the excitement of next year is the fact that we're here's a conference. We're in here. Uh, and we're eligible for, you know, the wins, the standings, the playoffs, and here we go. And so I think that's – it's bittersweet in, in the fact I, I was a – you know, I've been here with D2. It was fun years, and there was a lot of wins, and, you know, D1 is going to get that way. We're going to be there. It, it's just – it's taking a little bit of time, and we got to navigate through these things. Coach Willis, we're excited. I know it's been a good bye week. Looking forward to next week. Thanks for joining us. All right, man. Appreciate it. That will do it for this week's episode of the Purple and Gold Hour. Thanks to each and every one of our guests, to Butler Kane and Rachel Kuntz for coming by to talk about town and gown, to Stedman Campbell and Tyler Rice, and, of course, UNA head football coach Chris Willis. That will do it. We'll be back next week. This has been the Purple and Gold Hour, presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. This has been the Purple and Gold Hour, presented by the University of North Alabama Foundation. Thanks for listening, and remember that you can catch the Purple and Gold Show two hours prior to every football game, right here on 98.3 WLX, the home of the Lions. Roar Lions!